elsewhere the Great Northern and almost every other railroad in the United States had started to pull up the tracks of their branch lines and board up uncounted depots on their main lines, beginning to feel the pinch from the internal combustion engine. A lot of people don't realize the internal combustion engine is different from the external combustion engine. The external combustion engine burns the fuel outside of the engine, uh, makes steam and injects the steam into the engine to produce movement. The internal combustion engine explodes stuff inside the engine. Now the next chapter is on Henry Ford's new era, but we're not going to go to that. We've accidentally, oops, we've accidentally again bumped into the 1900s. So we're going to have to go back into the 1800s now for a couple more biographies on great men. The next biography will be on John Jacob Astor uh, and the fur trade testing the role of government from Empire Builders by Burton Folsom Jr. I'm going to start on page one. I just want to remind you uh, with this pr uh, first paragraph and a half here that any good history of any subject begins with the Greeks. Quote, I shall begin with our ancestors, Pericles said over 2,400 years ago in his funeral oration. And if our remote ancestors deserve praise, much more do our own fathers, who added to their inheritance the empire which we now possess, and spared no pains to be able to leave their acquisitions to us of the present generation. End quote. That's all we need from the introductions. Just wanted to remind you that uh, the Greeks are at the beginning of any good history of any, good s of any subject. There's John Jacob Astor. Uh, Real-life Horatio Alger dominated the U.S. fur trade despite some attempts by the U.S. government to legislate him out of business. One hundred years ago, the best-selling novels in America were written by Horatio Alger. His storyline is a familiar one. An immigrant comes to America seeking his fortune. He begins by doing menial tasks and then, by pluck and luck, climbs the ladder of success. He finds a good product to sell and soon starts his own business. He competes head-to-head -head with other companies, led by educated men from fine families. He confronts obstacles and challenges a swindler in the marketplace. In the end, the skill, the pluck, and the drive of the immigrant help him triumph over all adversity basic plot from Horatio Alger. Her, even before Horatio Alger began writing these types of novels, the United States had its own real-life Horatio Alger story, and much of it was lived out in Michigan. The hero was John Jacob Astor, a multi-millionaire fur trader and the first U.S. entrepreneur to challenge a government-run business. To understand Astor, we need to start with the fur trade. The buying and selling of furs was a major industry in America throughout its early history. The key animal in the fur trade was the beaver, whose pelt made hats that were in style all over Europe in the 1700s. The fur trade was a worldwide enterprise. It linked fashionable women in Paris to New York exporters, to frontier traders, to Indian trappers. This is like a global economy. This is like globalization. The pelts of beavers, muskrats, otters, and minks went one way, and kettles, blankets, axes, and muskets went the other. At first, fur trading in the U.S. followed established patterns. The French and the British had traded with the Indians for more than a century, and the Americans simply picked up where they left off. Trapping methods, river routes, and trading posts were all in place. Massive in infrastructure, all ready to take this resource of fur out of the wild. The man who confounded the normal development of private enterprise in furs was none other than President George Washington. Washington grew up in an era of mercantilism. Governments would freely grant monopolies to gain certain political and economic advantages. Adam Smith, of course, challenged this kind of thinking in 1776 in The Wealth of Nations. But ideas take time to percolate. Washington viewed the British fur traders in the Michigan area, then the Northwest Territory, as a menace to America's future. They might stir up the Indians, win the Indians' loyalty, loyalties, and thwart U.S. expansion into its Northwest Territory. Private American traders, Washington argues, were too few to compete with the larger, more experienced British. The U.S. government itself was needed to build a large trading post 
oust the British, bring in a small profit, and fix them strongly in our interest. Fix the Indians, that is, in our interest. The Indians especially needed to see evidence of American strength, so Washington recommended that the government build and operate a series of fur factories throughout the American South and Northwest. With Washington's support, Congress appropriated $50,000 for new factories in 1795, and it steadily, and raised it steadily in later years to $300,000. Such a subsidy was a large expense for a new nation, and one that tested government's ability to be an entrepreneur. Here's how the factory system worked. The government created a bureaucracy, the Office of Indian Affairs, to conduct the fur trade. It used the $300,000 from Congress to set up trading posts, usually near military forts, stock them with goods, and pay agents to buy, store, and transfer furs from the trading post to Washington, D.C., where they would be sold at auction. Once the factories were funded, they were supposed to be self-supporting and, perhaps as Washington said, bring in a small profit. Agents in the factories would use the first batch of goods to buy furs, then, when the furs were sold, the agents could buy more goods and repeat the cycle. Almost from the start, however, the factory system struggled. Well into the 1800s, the British companies were trading actively throughout the Great Lakes area. So were private American traders. The factories were so poorly run that many Indians held them in contempt and refused to trade there. In 1816, President Monroe appointed Thomas McKinney, a Washington merchant, to take charge of the Office of Indian Affairs and help the factories expand their business. McKinney worked hard and took his job seriously. Now, he wanted the Indians to have schools and farms, not just trapping and hunting. He wanted to assimilate the Indians. So an active government, he believed, was the best means to trade with the Indians and help them assimilate into our culture. Continuing the quote, as chief officer of the government fur trade, McKinney put his stamp on the business in many ways. First, he tried to slash costs by limiting credit and gifts. Some called them bribes to the Indians. Second, McKinney tried to buy American for the factories when possible. Indians, for example, needed muskets. McKinney responded by rejecting English uh, imports and giving large contracts to Henry Derringer, which established him as a major weapons producer, or helped establish him. Third, McKinney so much wanted Indians to become farmers that he stocked the factories with hoes, plows, and other farm equipment. Now remember, this is at a time when 97% of the people in society uh, live on a farm, own a farm. This is the time when every single president owns a farm. He urged agents at the factories to have gardens outside their walls to show the Indians what they could grow if they would just exchange their pelts for plows. McKinney's ideas were a disaster. Indians wanted gifts, they needed credit, and they shunned plows. But since McKinney was funded regularly each year by government, regardless of his volume of trade, he had no incentive to change his tactics. Private traders, however, had to please Indians or go broke. As private traders grew in numbers and wealth in early 1800s, one of them, John Jacob Astor, grew so rich he surpassed the government factories in capital, influence, and volume of business. Astor, the son of a German butcher, came to the U.S. in 1784 at age 20 to join his brother in selling violins and flutes. Soon, however, he changed his tune. He became fascinated with the fur trade and studied it day and night. He learned prices, markets, and trade routes for all kinds of pelts. The fur territory of New York and Montreal became Astor's domain of trade. He bought and sold cautiously at first, then with more confidence as the profits rolled in. With commanding vision and masterful detail, he could profitably buy furs in Michigan, pack them on a boat to New York, ship them to China, and bring tea back home. Astor separated himself from others through his foresight and perseverance. If the matrons of France wanted beaver hats and otter coats, and if these animals roamed the forests of New York, that was all most traders cared to know. Astor, however, thought more of world trade. Europeans liked to fight each other. Wars disrupted markets. Why not expand and sell furs to the Chinese? Not for fashion, but for warmth, in their unheated houses. Besides, he could bring the tea back from China and profit at both ends. The large market of the Far East prompted Astor to turn his sights west to Michigan. New York and the Atlantic coast were depleted of furs by the early 1800s. The Great Lakes area, especially the Michigan Territory, then became the heart of fur trade, and pumped out thousands of skins for coats and rugs all over the world. 